Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up on the latest in ag is a challenge, to say the least. But there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic, grain, and energy solutions born of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up-to-date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. And taking a look at Tuesday's market trade, a little bit to talk about. We saw wheat under some pressure. Quarter beans were relatively quiet. We saw a decent day in cattle. Uh, just a lot to unpack here as we prepare for Thursday's World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates Report. Joining us now, we welcome in our good friend Matt Bennett with agmarket.net. And Matt, uh, happy new year to you, buddy. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for being on the show today. Absolutely, bud. Same to you. Glad to be here. Well, let's dive in, and I think just thousand foot view to start before we really get into talking about the WASD coming up on Thursday and more. You know, I alluded to some of the moves we saw in the market Tuesday. To me, it kind of feels like we're we're chopping a little bit, squaring positions a little bit, seeing some moves one way or another with the dollar higher, lower, etc. Thousand foot view as you look at this market here after the rough week last week, and then coming into a bit of a quieter week this week. What's your assessment of what we've seen so far, Matt? Yeah, I think whenever it gets right down to it, we've, you know, we lost some ground since the first year, especially with corn. Uh, but let's be uh, frank about it. You know, going into the end of the year, we actually rallied corn and beans, mm -hmm. rallied healthily. Uh, and whenever you look at no beans, July beans and these corn, as of Jan 1 or the calendar turn, is the highest prices we'd ever seen for those three. As far as July corn is the third highest we'd ever seen, but within about 10 to 15 cents. And so, you know, in essence, uh, for this time of year, you had the highest prices we've ever seen. And so um, it's bound to happen that the funds would come in, uh, probably do a little bit of rebalancing as long as the uh, current trends didn't change too much. And, you know, let's face it, this Argentine situation, you know, we know they're hot and dry. We know that there's probably been some damage there, uh, but the forecast seems to change every day. You know, mm -hmm. you look up today and all of a sudden the noon forecast down there is that uh, you're going to see uh, continued heat. Whereas yesterday, uh, you know, they're talking about rain. And so, uh, you know, it's an old fashioned weather market. It's just on a different side of the globe right now. But, you know, I think that uh, thousand foot view for me, it just seems like the markets are maybe a touch heavy. Uh, and I think a lot of that is just, you know, people are a little nervous about this report. January report has a tendency to really swing things. And from, from a farmer's perspective, you know, you've got to ask yourself, uh, the swing higher, is it going to hurt you? Probably not. Swing lower, it could hurt, especially given what we put into this crop this year. Well, and I, I'm glad you you set it up that way as well, because I think about that rally we had through the holidays, and then we we essentially gave it all back, and we're kind of sitting right now about where we were before the rally started. So going into this January report, I, I think it begs the question, if I'm a producer here, new calendar year, I know there's been some farmers selling, maybe haven't done quite a, a whole lot yet, but you want to protect yourself. It, it seems like it seems like a no-brainer to try and protect some of these levels here heading into what you mentioned is typically a very big and can be a very market moving report. Oh, absolutely. And so, you know, what do you what do you do as a producer whenever, you know, your break even is for instance uh, 5 to 520 maybe as far as new crop corn is concerned. Beans actually, a lot of the break evens we've seen 11 to 11.50, you know, which uh, there's a lot more meat on the bone as far as soybeans are concerned with a lot of producers we're looking at. You know, I think with corn, a lot of these folks, uh, including myself, you know, we're, we're going for the gold and we know that inputs are expensive. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't cut too much. A lot, most people had cash in their pocket. And so they really didn't feel like uh, uh, they wanted to cut uh, too much as far as that was concerned. But, you know, whenever you look at it, man, I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's a little bit complicated because, the last couple of years, we've been so profitable that, in my opinion, it's got us a bit distorted. Uh, maybe we're not thinking as clearly as what we would uh, like to, um, you know, and, and I'm not trying to stereotype because I do the same thing. You know, if you, if you made two, three, four, five hundred bucks an acre in 22, and I know there was folks that did, 
if that's the case and you're looking at $150 type of net profit right now at average yields, a lot of people are snubbing their nose at it. But I'll tell you what, it makes me a little concerned, a little nervous to do that type of thing, especially when I look historically back at years like 15 through 19. I'll tell you what, we'd have given anything for 150 bucks an acre net profit. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great point. I, I want to talk a little bit about this report as well, just to kind of set this up. I know uh, agmarket.net, you guys uh, released some of your estimates ahead of that. I'm going to pull them up on the video screen. And you guys, uh, of course, a division of John Stewart Associates, if you see that on the video screen on, on the uh, PDFs that you guys sent out. But let's just talk through these estimates and your feelings here heading into this report. I know quarterly stocks up first. What are your thoughts uh, there, Matt? You know, we, we kind of felt like as far as quarterly stocks were concerned, that, and I'll tell you, Jesse, it's probably the hardest one, especially with corn and beans, to be able to forecast. You know, it's the first quarter of the year. You don't know exactly what total production is. That's what USDA is going to come at us with uh, tomorrow. So uh, you know what they said in November. Uh, you know what acreage was and you know what yield was, but it, it's a tough one to to forecast. And so, you know, we felt like quarterly stocks would come in, as you see, kind of right in the middle of the range of guesses. But one thing I want to point out on corn, Jesse, is that your range of guesses is 10.7 up to 11.9. I mean, that's a huge range of guesses, 1.2 billion. I mean, that's the carryout right now. So it's just an incredible disparity there. And you can tell how much people struggle with trying to figure out uh, where this number might come in because we do know uh, several things. Demand has been impacted. We know that. Now, does that mean the USDA is going to come in and just slash the heck out of demand? Eh, not necessarily because we're early in the year. You know, and they can make all kinds of assumptions as to how things are going to happen uh, throughout the rest of this marketing year. But uh, the bottom line is demand has been impacted by high prices because high prices cure high prices. We know that it, it just it's just the way things work. And so it's going to be very interesting as we come in here to not only get, you know, final yield, but to see what these carryouts look like, because this is where the rubber hits the road, you know, mm -hmm. is, is uh, uh, what are stocks? You know, what, what are, what's the carryout going to be for this marketing year? It's going to be very interesting going to be very interesting. It seems like a lot of folks casting a wide net here just to try and get some answers. Let's pull up as well, uh, quartered soybean crops production, winter wheat seedings, uh, another part of the equation we're going to see coming up here on Thursday. What are your thoughts with, with some of these numbers that agmarket.net's put out for the uh, pre-report estimates? Yeah, so, you know, we kind of felt like yield was going to come up a little bit, quite frankly. You know, here's the thing. Uh, you went down in September and October, as far as USDA was concerned. They scaled back yield on both corn and beans. And then all of a sudden in November, you actually saw an uptick in yield for both corn and beans. And so typically when you see the trend shift like that in the month of November, uh, historically you'll see a continuation of that, uh, not every year, but there, there's certainly been a correlation there that you would see the uh, that trend continue. So uh, could we see a further uptick in yield? I think it's certainly possible. Is it going to be anything massive? I mean, looking at basis levels throughout the country, it's hard for me to believe that it would be anything you know, extravagant. Uh, but by all means, we feel like you'll, you'll, you'll see yield pop up a little bit for both corn and beans, carry outs a little bit as well. But we don't look for, for instance, uh, uh, you know, our, our carry to, to get extravagantly larger. Um, you know, if it's 100, 150, I think that um, it's something that you know, on corn, you know, I, I think it's it's digestible. I think the trade has kind of tipped the cap over the last several days that maybe that's the way they're leaning. Uh, but at the same time, um, you got to understand that uh, you're still at an extremely tight, tight level. On the winter wheat side, I, I wonder your thoughts on this. If we see a high winter wheat seedings number, I wonder what that could do for the acre battle going into the spring, Matt. Yeah, I mean, if you see uh, high winter uh, seedings, it's, I guess it'd be hard to argue with. You know, over the last uh, several months, you've seen awfully strong wheat prices. I mean, it's no secret that, you know, a lot of these folks that are doing double crop soybeans after winter wheat have just absolutely cleaned house as far as profit margins have been concerned. And so in that part of the world, me and South, you know, and you can draw a line over West and there's still several folks that do things like this. Uh, I think that wheat seedings actually were pretty strong. And so, you know, uh, what's it going to do for the corn and soybean acreage and, you know, others like, for instance, cotton, you know, I think that some folks have some work to do. I feel like beans have been, uh, trying to buy acres over the last or you know actually since the first of the year but uh, you know towards the end of the calendar year uh, obviously 
great uh, market move there. Uh, but corn hasn't performed as well as what soybeans have. And I've got to think that uh, there's a lot of folks looking at this as an opportunity for beans to maybe pick up some acreage. Uh, does it have anything to do with renewable diesel? You know, maybe not on the surface, but I do think there's an underpinning there. And I, I think mm -hmm. that uh, moving forward, uh, you're going to see a heck of a lot more enthusiasm as you move into like a 2024. And I've got to think that there's there's some of that support already present. Well, and a real quick addition to my first thought there, if we see a higher winter wheat seedings number with the drought issues that we have in the central and southern plains, could that have any potential impact if we see, oh man, we got a, a higher number, but that crop's in poor condition. I, I wonder if that would do anything at all, Matt. Yeah, it's it, it's certainly possible that you could see some abandonment. There's no doubt that it could maybe throw a few acres back into the mix, you know, but the thing is uh, we've seen a shift other than really Kansas down into Texas. Uh, uh, a good chunk of this Western Corn Belt has healed up over the last uh, couple weeks. Uh, it's nice to see all the rainfall out in uh, California. I know it's, called, it's wreaking some havoc, so you hate to see that. But at the same time, you know, here in some of these reservoirs or lakes come up 60 to 100 feet, you know, you're probably looking at a better weather pattern uh, moving forward. So hopefully Kansas and Texas uh, panhandle area be able to participate in that. And if they can, you know, by all means, I think that uh, you could be looking at a lot better wheat crop than what we thought going into dormancy. But by uh, at the same time, you know, that crop didn't really look very good going into dormancy. I think it was one of the worst rated crops we'd ever seen uh, as you went into that time frame. Matt Bennett, agmarket.net, is our guest here today on the show. We're continuing to talk about the uh, estimates ahead of the WASDE report and quarterly grain stocks on Thursday. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about some of these charts, just looking at ending stocks. And I know we touched on this a little bit already, but as you alluded to with the corn number, the pre-report estimates and looking at the current carryout, I, I mean, some of these numbers, I feel like with USDA coming up on Thursday, there's going to be surprises. There typically is. And, and I feel like this year I'm starting to get that gut feeling that there's going to be more than maybe folks expect. Yeah. And so I would say this, Jesse, if I had to make a guess uh, where the surprise might come from, I think you could certainly make a case that it would be for more corn stocks. You know, you came in at 1257 uh, in the month of December as far as USDA was concerned. You know, but we kind of expect a little bit of an uptick in yield. I don't want to argue with a drop in demand. I think the USDA might be slow uh, to kind of move in that direction. Yeah, ethanol numbers have been horrible the last two weeks, especially this last week. Uh, exports, as we all know, have underperformed. But still, there is opportunity. I think maybe the prime time for exports is ahead of us. Uh, being that Brazil will not have a ton of corn to be able to put out on that export market. And we all know uh, Black Sea region has not, uh, you know, been putting enough out there to satisfy all your world buyers by any stretch of the imagination. So, you know, I've got to think that we've got the opportunity to heal up somewhat. I don't know that we're going to hit the USDA number, uh, but I think we'll heal up to an extent. If they were going to drop uh, demand, I think it's probably going to be on the export side of things. You know, this residual number is always impossible to guess, but uh, mm -hmm. there could be some movement there too. So, you know, if you came in above that highest estimate at 1.405, uh, uh, it wouldn't shock me. You know, yeah, we came in at 1314. That was our best guess given the information we had. But Jesse, this is a hard number to come up with. You know, there's a lot of moving parts here. It's the, it's the toughest report really to submit estimates for. And uh, again, there's going to be surprises. I agree with you. I just wish I knew what they were going to be. <laughs> I think we all do. Well, and too, we've alluded to South America and just looking at these numbers here, the last bit of numbers that you guys uh, released with agmarket.net. And again, my intention really goes to Argentina. I think with Brazil, I think we all know that despite some dryness in the South, uh, Brazil's looking really good. It's going to come down to Argentina at this point. And that just seems to be the, the biggest concern of the trade right now. Certainly. And so if it's an Argentina issue, you know, the, there's no doubt that the issue has more to do with really with soybean meal than what it do, does soybeans. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing about it is that Argentina, you know, they'll put out 50 percent or more of the world's soybean meal out on the world export market. You know, and so whenever you look, uh, uh, you're going to see more production of soybeans out of the southern hemisphere, almost certainly. And it could be by a fair amount. And I'm talking whole soybeans, of course. Uh, but you look over here and, and, and today you close, you know, uh, uh, soybean meal on, on your lead month futures, uh, January there, 
I mean, 500 bucks still. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just an incredible deal. Uh, but you look at soybeans and, you know, maybe you're not going to participate as much. Uh, but I will say this. Typically, whenever you're in a stocks building situation in the world, and that's what it appears we're going to be, uh, go from that 90 type area to maybe uh, pushing 100. Because I do think that's going to come down. We were over 100 last month. If, if you are building stocks in the world due to the fact that you've got a bigger overall crop in South America, uh, that's not typically the situation where you see market prices rally. So we have to understand kind of how these things work. Yes, there's excitement with Argentina. It's given us a real shot in the arm. And that's a shot in the arm we should be thankful for, in my opinion, rather than looking at it as, you know, what more can we get out of it? Well, plenty of unknowns, plenty of things to watch for with the January numbers coming up on Thursday. Matt, let's move over to livestock and talk about what we're seeing cattle and hog wise. This hog market, uh, I don't know what we could say there, Matt. It's just been so, so volatile here as of late end of the year, beginning of this year. Any thoughts of what you're seeing in this hog trade right now? comes down to China, essentially, you know, what, what's their economy going to do, first of all? Yeah. Um, and we all know that there's a lot of question marks there. Uh, we know that they consume a ton of pork. Uh, and the bottom line is, if, if the Chinese economy is healthy, it's pretty hard to get down on the pork situation. You know, you've got to think this hog market would stay uh, fairly strong uh, uh, if their economy look good. It just doesn't right now. And again, there's too many question marks. I think that the uh, Chinese situation and the exports are going to have to both be strong, you know, to support triple digit type hog prices. You've got them on the, uh, on the deferred months, but certainly uh, your front month has just absolutely gotten beaten with a, a ugly stick here over the last couple of weeks. It's just been brutal. But, uh, you know, I would think maybe we would get some support uh, out of the cattle side of the things uh, because protein and whole, in my opinion, is still a very strong uh, market. I, I still am very friendly cattle prices on further out. That's, uh, you know, assuming that equities hold constant, but uh, uh, I, I just really struggle to get down on these cattle prices. The uh, numbers are going to continue to dwindle, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to be in a situation where if people's consumption stays relatively static, then I'll tell you what, you could be looking at a really interesting uh, cattle situation here in 23, especially when you get farther out into the year. Well, and with the cash cattle trade, I know last week was maybe a little disappointing, but it sounds like there's plenty of optimism this week that we're going to see higher cash once again. And just, you know, I, I know the futures trade was okay on Tuesday, but you look out, especially at feeders, at, you know, summer months, over 200 bucks. I mean, I'm with you. There's there still just feels like a lot of optimism in this cattle market cash market still feels very robust there just feels like there's a lot of good upward momentum here absolutely absolutely now with that being the case i think everybody's leaning that way so maybe we ought to be a little bit cautious but i would say mm -hmm. if you wanted to paint a picture of a bullish situation fundamentally for cattle you've got all the ingredients you need it's just a matter of can this economy hold together do people still want to go out and spend 150 bucks on, you know, you and your wife or you and your husband going out to eat a steak dinner? Because let's face it, it's what you throw a couple of drinks in there and all of a sudden you're $200. I mean, it's expensive to go out and eat a good steak, but we all like to do it. And, and the consumer enjoys that. And as long as they feel good about their situation, they're going to continue doing that. And that's going to be at a time whenever there's less beef available. Very true. And you mentioned the economy. I know Fed Chair Powell spoke on Tuesday saying unpopular decisions needed to bring down inflation. So it seems uh, from that quote, at least, or that little bullet point to me that the Fed's still very much in on the, you know, interest rate hikes to try and tame inflation. How much, how much more they're going to move up it remains to be seen. But to your point as well, I, I still think the economy is going to be a big thing to watch. And crude oil, too, still feels like kind of a canary uh, in the coal mine here for these markets overall, Matt. Oh, no doubt about it. And so crude, you know, we've seems like we want to make a run at 70 and then we want to make a run at 80. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, this crude oil market's been kind of hard to figure out. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, overall, you still have some strength probably there. I've got to think, you know, ultimately OPEC might end up doing something if they feel like uh, – uh, they're not going to raise prices so high that people are actually going to go to Russia and buy oil. I, I just think there's a lot going on there. Uh, they kind of want to stick it to them. Uh, it, it sure seems to me, at least part of it. Uh, but, you know, I mean, today you come in here and you rally the dollar a little bit, you know, and, and crude oil was still able to close higher or, or, or as higher as you and I talk. 
a pretty good sign, actually. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, energies uh, uh, it'd be very interesting to see how energies perform moving forward. I don't, I don't want to put any uh, predictions out there because it's it's really hard to figure it out. Uh, but mm -hmm. one thing's for sure: if we do see energy stay strong and stay supported, it's going to be very supportive towards our ag commodities as well. Very true, Matt. Any final thoughts, real quick, before we uh, let you go today? No, you know, um, just uh, got to keep our wits about us. This report's probably going to be an emotional type day. It could be a, a wild ride. And, uh, you know, if it goes higher, once again, I don't think anybody's going to care. We're all going to go home and have a good time and, and smile. If it's down, uh, I hope you have some sort of a plan to where you can sleep good on Thursday night because uh, we've had every opportunity in the world to have risk management put in place. We have. If folks need uh, some advice, they have questions, they want to reach out to you and the team there at agmarket.net. I know you guys have a lot of great resources, online, app, phone call, a lot of great ways to get in touch, isn't there, Matt? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can find us pretty easily. Just Google us if nothing else. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Agmarket.net, again, is the website. With that, Matt Bennett, thanks for joining us today. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Absolutely. Same to you, bud. And that's going to do it for Market Talk today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.